Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, helping with moving, <laughs> chair moving. That was a strange setup for the room. Um, so I would like to welcome everybody to the third in our lecture series on uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And um, I'm going to just remind folks who haven't been traveling with us through the semester what we're doing. So this is a lecture series that's attached to a class that I've been teaching the semester at Brown called Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And uh, so um, the first part of this experience together is going to be a lecture from our guest. And uh, when the lecture is done and discussion's over, uh, we'll take a five minute break and then the students who are in the class will remain to discuss readings with the speaker. Others are welcome to stay, but as I've said for other times we've done this, it may not be as interesting, because if you haven't done the readings, <laughs> it's, it's uh, uh, we will be actually talking about particular texts. So um, so those who have done the reading uh, or and or are in the class are invited to stay for that part. Um, so uh, it's a profound pleasure to introduce to you Ethan Katz. Um, Ethan received his PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2009, and since 2010, he's been assistant professor of history and Judaic studies at the University of Cincinnati. He's currently completing a study of Jewish-Muslim relations in France since the First World War, which is entitled The Burdens of Brotherhood, Jews and Muslims from North Africa to France, which is currently under contract with Harvard University Press. He's also co-editor of the first book-length engagement between the secularism, de secularism Debate and the Field of Jewish Studies in a book that is not yet out but soon to be entitled Secularism and the Jews, which will come out with the University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, Katz has published a number of articles in journals uh, such as Jewish Quarterly Review, the Journal of North African Studies, and the Journal of European Studies. He's also been the recipient of a number of um, very well-respected um, grants and fellowships, including at the Advanced Judaic Study Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, there's some chairs up here, guys, if you need them in the front. <laughs> um, so that's the formal bio. I just want to say a few other things um, in this introduction. Um, so Ethan and I have known each other a long time, and the way we got to know each other, um, it's fun to introduce people that you know well and like a lot, and Ethan is one of these such people. The way Ethan and I got to know each other is uh, I, a very, very long time ago when I was just starting the book that I just published on Muslim Jewish relations in France. Um, I got an email from a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin writing me to say, I heard about the project you've started, and I've just, I've been working on it for about a year, um, and uh, I'm about to start a similar project, and uh, somebody suggested that I contact you. Now, when you get an email like that <laughs> to somebody telling you that who's a graduate student that they're starting a project that is the same as your project. You have two choices. Uh, one is to take a uh, assume a voice of stature and <laughs> say, <clears throat> I am the specialist on this. I've started my work, and you should find another project. That's one option. Um, somebody had done that with me when I was a graduate student when I said what I was working on, and um, it wasn't the most. Uh, welcoming response. So there's another response in that moment, which is to take a deep breath and say, oh, that's so exciting that somebody else is working on a project I'm interested in. Uh, let's see uh, what we can learn from each other. And thus began um, a really, really wonderfully fruitful relationship. Um, and uh, this lecture is part of that relationship. Um, we, we are co-editing a book together, which I didn't mention on the list of forthcoming publications that Ethan is responsible for, but we are, we are jointly uh, editing a book on um, colonialism and Jewish history. Uh, and I can say that um, Ethan is among the most sophisticated and interesting and generous scholars of Jewish history that I've had the pleasure to work with uh, over the years that I have had the privilege of being working in this field. So it's really a great honor and privilege to welcome Ethan Katzdorf. Well, thank you, Maud. I, uh, I need to take you on the road uh, with me. Um, seriously, but thank you for that very uh, warm and generous and touching introduction. Um, thank you for bringing me here uh, and, and arranging all this. It's really a pleasure to be able to participate in this class on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and to discuss uh, this important topic here at Brown. Now, my talk today uh, it's supposed to be uh, about colonialism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia in modern European history. 
but this is a fairly vast topic. Uh, a number of distinguished scholars have written about it from various angles, and I can't possibly do justice to the whole topic in a single presentation today. Uh, therefore, I'm going to focus more specifically on how colonialism shaped, utilized, and manifested itself in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia from the mid-19th to the mid-20th century. Uh, and in order to bring concrete specificity to the discussion, I will confine my talk to the French Empire, particularly French Algeria, a choice I'll explain more in a moment. I'm going to start my talk by sketching briefly the ways that European colonial ideology and practice lent themselves from early on to anti-Semitic and Islamophobic tendencies. And I will then proceed through a series of three what I call historical snapshots. These come from 1870, 1916, and 1942. Broadly speaking, this talk will trace three stages of history. First, we will see how in the 19th century, with respect to French Algeria, but also often more broadly, Islamophobia became much more pronounced in the colonial venture than anti-Semitism. Though Jews' position was never entirely secure, in certain instances they even benefited from colonial rule. By the period between the two world wars, anti-Semitism had gained growing ferocity across Europe, uh, and France itself included, and the, and the colonial venture had also reached its peak. Both Jews and Muslims were frequently depicted with highly racialized imagery, and in many instances faced significant legal and social discrimination. At the same time, Muslims in particular were often the target of propaganda campaigns meant to win their loyalty for one European power or another, as well as provocations meant to turn them against Jews. In the third stage, during the Second World War, the growing horror of the anti-Semitism of the Holocaust crystallized, and Muslims, meanwhile, found their positions remarkably elevated as Europe's colonial power struggled to maintain <coughs> control and political forces of all stripes saw in Muslims a possible constituency for their wartime aims. So first, colonialism's attraction to anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. As we know, empires did not suddenly arrive on the scene of world history in the 19th century. Even as Britain, France, and in time, lesser powers like Holland and Germany divided up large parts of the globe, conquering new territories, exploiting their resources, and subjugating their peoples, they in many respects acted simply as powerful states had for millennia. But the great difference was that this occurred in the Europe of the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, and modern liberalism. These developments had introduced a series of powerful claims about the existence of the nation state, popular sovereignty, the public good, and more broadly, universal principles by which polities should be organized. Fierce battles raged throughout much of Europe regarding how far universal principles would go and by what criteria certain groups would be included and others excluded. Race, gender, religion, and class were among the criteria most frequently utilized to distinguish between full citizens and those who were something less. Exercising colonial rule while claiming to uphold some version of these principles of universalized citizenship forced European powers to face the question of how far the new notions of rights and equality might extend into their empires. Ultimately, by definition, the colony could not become home to universal rights. Settler colonies like Algeria attracted colonists in significant part because of the distinct privileges that they would have there the opportunities that were uniquely available to Europeans for economic and political power. Only if the European colonist was legally superior in such places would such opportunities exist. Another major, major motivation and rhetoric of colonialism was the so-called civilizing mission, whereby Europe would prepare colonized parts of the world to enter the civilized world and eventually, following their enlightenment and education, enjoy equal standing. Only if Europe was considered superior and the colonized world inferior could such a mission have any logic, and only if Europe remained superior and that moment of equality remained forever in the distance would the civilizing mission have ample reason to continue. Beyond these practical realities, more intangible factors served as well to essentialize the colonized, including Muslims and Jews, in the 19th century European mind. These included a series of long-standing ubiquitous Orientalist images and associations that exoticized both groups. For many Europeans, the disproportionate fascination with Muslims and Jews meant that both groups were at once different and alluring, uncivilized and intriguing as possible targets of the civilizing mission. And such an outlook connected to another key ingredient, religion, and specifically the history and specter of Christian missionary work. 
due to all the ways that Europeans associated Jews, Muslims, and other colonized peoples with ideas antithetical to the Enlightenment on the one hand, and to the manner in which European colonization connected itself to the work of human progress on the other hand, one can reasonably understand modern colonialism as in significant part a secularized version of European missionary work overseas. At the very least, the image of the Christian missionary spreading the gospel was not far from that of the enlightened European colonists setting off to share the fruits of civilization. Who better to receive the new divine wisdom, as it were, than Muslims and Jews, both long-standing objects of religious hostility, fascination, and conversion fantasies. Thus, colonialism relied upon hierarchical thinking, actual hierarchies of political and economic power, and long-standing Orientalist and religious imaginations that all lent themselves to the exoticizing of Jews, Muslims, and other less familiar groups within the European colonial project. The final element needed to harden such notions was that of modern race thinking. It is hardly a coincidence that the era of great colonial expansion in the last decades of the 19th century was also the era of the rise of racial thinking. During this period, as is well known, a growing number of leading philosophers and political leaders, but also experts in eugenics and so-called race science, articulated ideas about hierarchies of races, of so-called white European superiority, and of the inferiority of allegedly darker-skinned peoples, with Jews and Muslims often included in the latter categories. The social sciences of anthropology and ethnography also played a major role in such outlooks. Frequently, ethnographers accompanied colonial settlers to newly conquered territories, where they wove elaborate, frequently contradictory theories about the racial hierarchies among the local population. In light of these larger confluences between colonialism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia, let me explain briefly my choice to focus on France and the Francophone world. France's empire, more than any other, governed over large numbers of Jews and Muslims, often in the same lands, for well over a century. France took a particular interest in each of these populations in a manner connected closely to its own projects of nation and empire building. During the French Revolution of 1789, in an important signal of the universal rights and equality pledged by the revolutionaries, France became the first country in Europe to offer full citizenship to its Jews. By the 20th century, French statesmen and commentators excuse me, frequently referred to France as one of the world's great, quote, Islamic empires because of its large colonial holdings with substantial Muslim populations in North Africa, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. The case of French Algeria is of particular interest because the territory for most of the period from its conquest in 1832 to its independence in 1962 was not merely a colonial possession, but was actually part of France itself. So technically speaking, most of Algeria by the 1840s is becoming like Lyon or Marseille or Paris in terms of its jurisdictional stature as part uh, of France proper. And this meant that the contradictions of France as a universalist republic and a global empire as a country promising to bring the democratic ideals of the French Revolution to the world, while showing in its empire how many groups were excluded from such ideals, played out with unusual immediacy in Algeria. Frequently, Jews and Muslims lived such contradictions particularly vividly. And finally, related to these issues, France and its empire illustrate more clearly than, say, the British, German, or Dutch cases, the way that attitudes toward Muslims and Jews were often interrelated and rarely altogether independent of one another. This brings us to our first snapshot from 1870. So 1870, the Crimea Decree as hierarchy of exclusion. On October 24, 1870, with the so-called Crimea Decree, nearly all of Algeria's 37,000 Jews became full French citizens. The act was, so, was named the Crimea Decree due to its leading advocate, Alof Crimea, a prominent French lawyer, major figure in the French Jewish community, and the Minister of Justice in the French <coughs> government at the time. And the decree, which came 40 years after the French conquest of Algeria, was a startling event. It was the first time in French history that an entire group of people was granted citizenship based upon its religious affiliation. The moment crystallized a growing hierarchy of exclusion in 19th century Algeria, wherein the French administration came to favor greater rights for Jewish natives than Muslim natives. It was not at all clear that this would be the case from the outset of French rule in Algeria. Shortly after the conquest, French officials created three systems of law. 
The colonizers would be governed by French law and administrators. Both Jews and Muslims would remain under the jurisdiction of their own religious law and courts. In particular, with regard to family and religious questions, this system remained in place for decades. And meanwhile, during the early years of French conquest, French officials were frequently very uh, hostile in their attitudes toward Jews. Uh, during the first decade or so of colonial rule, there were repeated reports that discussed the, quote, problem of Jewish power in Algeria. Uh, one of the leading uh, French generals in the conquest of Algeria, uh, Thomas Robert Bougeot, even proposed at one point the removal of Jews from the <laughs> cities, and he longingly exclaimed, quote, oh, that we could replace through this means or by another the Jewish population. Nonetheless, French officials also began to see that they might benefit from seeking to partner with Algerian Jews. In part, this related to a constant concern that they would have as Algeria became a settler colony about the numbers in Algeria, that is, the number of French citizens. They were always looking for ways to increase the number of loyal French citizens there uh, to have a higher percentage of the population vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the larger native Muslim population. And in part, they also followed the direction of mainland French Jewry, which, in connection with its larger project of regenerating Jews as French citizens, began to explore the, quote, Frenchification of its fellow Jews across the Mediterranean. In 1842, with the help of the War Ministry, the official communal apparatus of French Jews, the Central Consistory, sent a fact-finding mission to Algeria. The report of the mission concluded that Algerian Jews, while living in poverty, could be, quote, regenerated and could also be useful in the project of French domination. In 1845, the consistory founded branches in all three major Algerian cities, excuse me, Algerian cities, uh, Algiers, Constantine, and Alhon. And during the ensuing two decades, French Jewish leaders and representatives sought to modernize and Frenchify the lifestyle practices and outlook of Algerian Jewry and to lobby the French government for their emancipation. We should note that sentiments among Algerian Jews were far more resistant. These often produced heated conflicts between metropolitan consistorial representatives and the Algerian Jews that they were seeking to, quote, Frenchify. Throughout the 19th century, as the work of historian Joshua Schreier has recently argued, colonial and French Jewish reformers often focused on the family as a crucial index of sophistication and civilization for Algerian natives. They frequently contrasted the relative permeability of the Jewish home with that of the Muslims. French Jewish reformer Joseph Cohen, for instance, in an 1843 article in the French Jewish newspaper Archie Israelite, praised what he termed the, quote, unveiled, accessible status of the Algerian Jewish woman in contrast to the closed, sequestered existence of Muslim women. He extended this depiction to one of broad differences between Jewish and Muslim, quote, domestic interiors. In the same 1842 report from the fact-finding mission to Algeria, and repeatedly thereafter, French Jewish reformers and their allies would draw sharp contrasts between stereotypes of veiled, domesticated, separated, unexposed Arab Muslim women beyond the reach of civilization and the increasingly free, open, educated, and civilized Algerian Jewish girl. Legislators, Jewish reformers, and legal theorists alike repeatedly identified Jewish and Islamic family law as the greatest obstacle to the naturalization of Algerian natives. Indeed, colonial lawmakers and reformers repeatedly invoked Jews and Muslims' alleged inability or unwillingness to accept, specifically in the realm of family, the distinction between civil and religious law. And this context proved crucial to the July 14, 1865 Senatus Consult, a new law that made all Algerian natives French nationals and stipulated that an individual Jew or Muslim could become a French citizen but that in order to do so, he had to request to be governed solely, quote, by the civil and political laws of France, giving up his Jewish or Muslim personal status, that is, his right to be governed by Jewish or Muslim law in regard to family and religious life. This did not produce a swell of uh, attempts to become French citizens, as you might imagine. Uh, by one count between 1865 and 1870, only 20 Jews opted to abandon their, quote, personal status in favor of French civil law. Debates about Jews' readiness for naturalization and whether Jewish or French family law should govern their lives continued, ultimately resolving with the 1870 Crimea Decree that gave them citizenship and placed them fully under French jurisdiction. For many Jews in Algeria, the change was neither expected nor welcome. 
But in ensuing decades, widespread attendance at French public schools, mandatory military conscription, economic upward mobility, and correspondent shifts in residential patterns all caused growing numbers of Algerian Jews to move away from traditional North African customs and to embrace Frenchness as their primary national and often cultural identity. The Kanye Decree had no equivalent among <coughs> Algeria's Muslims, for whom the 19th century proceeded very differently. While various reform acts improved the legal status of Muslims in Algeria during the first half of the 20th century, it was not until 1958, so 88 years later, four years before Algeria gained its independence from France, that the group would actually achieve fully equal <coughs> French citizenship. The decades following the Kanye Decree saw the rise of an anti-Muslim, and as we shall see, also anti-Semitic, Latin identity in large facets of the European settler society in Algeria. And this was shaped in significant part by the territory's large population of immigrants from Spain, Italy, and Malta. One of the key events in the political radicalization of these segments of the settler class and political administration out in Algeria was the 1871 Mokrani Revolt. Only months after the Crimea Decree, the northern mountainous region of Kabylia witnessed a brief but fierce guerrilla uprising led by a local sheikh, Mohammed el Mokrani. The revolt was crushed brutally by the French, and in the years and decades to follow, they expanded, systemized, and brutalized their colonial presence. The European settlers and colonial administration, meanwhile, were deeply alarmed by the sign of resistance from the colonized. Many settlers and colonial officials were certain it was the fault of the Crimea Decree itself and also saw in Jewish emancipation the haunting prospect of all other native Algerians, i.e. Muslims, gaining equality as well, an event that would have turned their colonial rule on its head. The fact that a large percentage of these settlers came as well from outside of France made many feel the need to assert their French patriotism even more strongly. Often this took the form of accentuating the difference of Jews and Muslims. In 1871, a movement arose to revoke the previous year's claim to decree and strip Algerian Jews of their newly won citizenship, but it was defeated in significant part through the sort of backdoor work of Adolf Kremia himself in Paris. Yet nonetheless, from this period until the Vichy regime, anti-Semitism would remain a constant of Algerian political life. And this stemmed from an effort to deny that Jews could really be Frenchified and to question their belonging to a ruling caste primarily made up of those of Catholic and Latin origin. The European settler classes, moreover, increasingly saw the metropolitan administration as out of touch with their needs and sought to make French Algeria in their own conservative image, viewing it as a kind of tabula rasa onto which their fantasies could be projected. The connections drawn by many European colonists between Jews and Muslims in Algeria at this moment are highly revealing of the relationship between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. The belief that jealous Muslims fomented the Macron revolt as a protest against the unfairness of the Crimea decree, I can barely stifle laughter at the prospect, offers an initial example of what would become repeatedly articulated European fears that Jews and Muslims were always at odds, seen by many as primitive tribal peoples ready to do battle with one another like their biblical ancestors. This, we should note, was long before the beginning of the Zionist Arab conflict which would often later be cited as an example or as the cause of certain Jewish-Muslim en enmity. Moreover, such a consideration shows how Jewish and Muslim rights were often connected in the minds of Europeans. The same, however, was not necessarily true for Muslims and Jews. During the Mokrani revolt, no call to war issued by Muslim religious leaders mentioned Jews. No statement before the tri tribunal that prosecuted participants in the revolt referred to Jews or Jewish rights. Many of the rebels even used Jewish lawyers to defend them. In the face of the efforts to undo the Crimea Decree in 1871, Jewish leaders secured a statement from a group of 24 Muslim notables in the city of Constantine that touted the Muslim population's support for the decree. Despite France's official goals of, quote, assimilating the native population of Algeria, the late 19th century witnessed a series of measures that created increasingly unbridgeable divides between the colony's European colonizers and the Muslim colonizers. In 1881, the French administration created a special native code consisting of extremely harsh penalties for violation of 33 separate restrictions imposed solely on native Muslims. Meanwhile, with the French citizenship law of 1889, all, quote, Europeans of Algeria became full French citizens. 
The administration continued to dismantle long-standing tribally and communally-based property systems of Muslim society, expropriating millions of acres of farmland, and it placed extreme tax burdens upon native Muslims. To be sure, we see here that in the late 19th century colonial context, Jews were seen by the French state and society as more capable than Muslims of being, quote, civilized. In the hierarchy of exclusion so crucial to the colonial context, Islamophobia proved far more absolute at this time than anti-Semitism. And moreover, this was not merely true in Algeria, though it was most evident there. In Tunisia, and subsequently Morocco, which became far more loosely ruled as so-called French protectorates in 1881 and 1912, respectively, and which never had the kind of large settler class uh, that came to Algeria, the French administration never promised assimilation to the inhabitants as it had in Algeria. Nevertheless, France was fairly cooperative in these colonies with the formation of dozens of schools of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, or AIU. The AIU, a French educational organization founded in 1860, sought to export the model of enlightened modern Franco Judaism across the Francophone world and beyond. Though the French administration refused to contemplate anything like the Crenu decree in either Tunisia or Morocco, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a few moments, the AIU schools offered a kind of Jewish specific model for Frenchification. Muslims, meanwhile, in both of these colonies had few avenues available to higher education or upward mobility of any sort in the French context. And yet, nonetheless, the elevation of Jews over Muslims, particularly in Algeria, was ever fragile and hotly contested. <coughs> this was never clearer than during the anti-Semitic outbreaks that occurred at the Fin de Siècle during the Dreyfus Affair. In May of 1897, in the port city of Moslaganem, in the middle of a cycling race, a fight broke out that resulted in Europeans and Muslims attacking the Jewish quarter. Max Regi, the newly elected president of the Anti-Jewish League and future mayor of the capital city of Algiers, who was elected the following year, directed his supporters to go into the Jewish section of Algiers and chant, long live the army, down with the Jews. More than 100 people were injured, many Jewish stores were looted, uh, and there were eventually a series of riots in the coming weeks and months across Algeria that targeted Jews. And this is really the moment where anti-Semitism took hold uh, as a central feature of Algerian political life. Uh, Regi founded a newspaper called L'Anti-Juif, uh, which was inspired actually by the ideas of notorious anti-Semitic French author Edouard Drummond, who had written the infamous screed La France Juive, or <coughs> Jewish France, in 1886. Uh, and this newspaper achieved quite a large circulation for its time, about 20,000. And Trumont himself was actually elected a deputy to the National Assembly from the second district of Algiers in 18, sorry, and that was in the following year, in 1898. Uh, three other candidates the same year uh, from the same anti-Semitic party won seats in Algiers, Ohan, and Constantine, which gave the anti-Semitic party four of the six of Algeria's uh, seats in the Chamber of Deputies. The city of Ohan elected a majority anti-Semitic municipal council for the first time. This would set the tone for its local politics for decades to come. During the affair, as alluded to already, a number of Algerian Muslims who had previously been calm in the face of anti-Semitic provocations did become hostile and attack Jews. Uh, and this is a momentary uh, switch, but it's a significant one uh, that would in some ways preview events of later decades. Our second snapshot comes from a highly charged and revealing confidential administrative document written by the French resident general of Tunisia at the height of World War I. And in order to fully appreciate its contents, we need to set the scene, as it were. From 1914 to 1918, in the course of the First World War, over 800,000 subjects of the French Empire came to metropolitan France to fight on the battlefield or work on the home front. And almost 400,000 of them were North African Muslims, it was about 260,000 were soldiers, about 130,000 were laborers. Uh, so this group made up a strong plurality of those colonial subjects engaged in the war effort. At the same time, about 38,000 Jews from France and North Africa fought for the French armed forces, and many members of both groups really saw their service in the war as an opportunity to further or complete their integration into the French nation. Uh, in many respects, this proved simpler for Jews than for Muslims, given their longer standing presence in France, their centralized communal structure, and their high levels of acculturation into French society. 
So in a sense, we could say that if Jewish service was a kind of affirmation of their belonging in France, particularly relevant uh, coming only about 10 years after the end of the Dreyfus Affair, for Muslims, service to the French war effort was more of a plea for basic recognition and rights. But the division was neither so stark nor so simple. First of all, despite the vaunted, quote, sacred union of Catholics, Protestants, and Jews during the war, and the fervent and very visible participation of Jews in the war effort, anti-Semitism hardly disappeared. The summer of 1915 saw a wave of accusations about France's Russian Jewish immigrants shirking their duty. <coughs> this led many not to enlist or even to flee the country. Uh, in the course of the war, there were over 150 publications that appeared in France uh, that, attacked, that attacked such alleged subversive forces as Jewish German spies or the Jewish Masonic conspiracy. Muslims, meanwhile, fought in far greater numbers than Jews, and they proved their value on the battlefield and the home front and began to develop new levels of political consciousness. During the war, on the one hand, French officials and politicians were observing firsthand that North African Muslims offered powerful possibilities for fulfilling various aspects of nation and empire building. On the other hand, as hundreds of thousands of Muslims fought under the French colors and carried French arms, they were acquiring new power that made the prospect of their insurrection more terrifying than ever. In forming colonial policy in North Africa, Jewish and Muslim interests and positions had to be considered very carefully then alongside one another. In this context, we can begin to appreciate the arresting document that I just mentioned. In autumn of 1916, Minister of War Pierre Roque wrote to the resident general of Tunisia, suggesting that in an effort to maximize the 1917 recruitment class of native troops, perhaps it would make sense to add a call to arms of all Tunisian Jews who were originally not included in military recruitment in Tunisia. In his lengthy revealing reply, which he marked confidential, Resident General Gabriel Alapetit unleashed a screed against Tunisian Jewry, upon which he relied to reject the minister's suggestion out of hand. Alapetit acknowledged that it was, quote, natural to compare Tunisian Jews to Algerian Jews, but contended their situations were dramatically different. Alapetit assumed that conscription among Tunisian Jews would translate into granting them citizenship en masse, an act he viewed as a costly provocation to Muslims. Quote, we must choose, he wrote, if we orient ourselves toward an extension of the Crémieu decree to Tunisia, this would be to accept the obligation going forward of containing the Muslim population only by force. This would be exchanging the faithfulness of important and proven Muslim military contingents for a Jewish secondary force that all of the current data permits us to consider as mediocre in every regard. al Petit described Jews as clannish and utterly disinterested in integration, the French cause, or any greater good, and characterized their conduct since the start of the war as ungenerous and exploitative, even, quote, parasitic to the potential, quote, ruin of many Muslims. In this context, he foresaw grave dangers in giving them a path to citizenship, claiming, quote, until the present political power has escaped the Jews in Tunisia, it is the only force they lack. They know well that if they have it, the enslavement of Muslim natives won't be long in coming. Deeply concerned about how Tunisian society would be disrupted by Jews serving en masse and implying that Jews were cowardly as soldiers, al Petit explained further that up until this point, Muslims had made sacrifices and submitted to France's military demands, but, quote, that is on the condition that the Israelites do not mix with them and do not spread here the cry of run for your lives. Meanwhile, according to the resident general, since the start of the war, Muslims had already experienced numerous attacks by Algerian Jewish soldiers stationed in Bizerte and Tunis, who, quote, adorned with a French uniform and armed with a bayonet or a revolver, cannot resist the desire to strike Muslims. Whew. al Petit's document was remarkable in displaying so openly such virulent anti-Semitism from a high-level colonial official but it encapsulated a wider culture in which the French administration in Tunisia repeatedly expressed profound misgivings about Jewish conduct, and specifically the volatility of Jewish-Muslim interchanges. In December of 1916, Simon Jogno, a Jewish soldier home on leave, was incarcerated for the murder of a Muslim. The official who wrote up the report concluded by citing, quote, the frequency and gravity of disorders by which the Israelite soldiers are at fault and in which the Tunisian Muslim and the Jeanne are nearly always victims. In this document from the French Governor General from World War I, 
Once more, we can see how, for French administrators and politicians, Jews and Muslim statuses were ever interrelated. Fears about one group closely informed attitudes about the other and vice versa. In several ways, the First World War would perpetuate the growing interest in both Jews and Muslims as players in colonial politics. The reforms of the so-called Journal Law of 1919, while relatively tepid in comparison to the expectations aroused by Muslim wartime service, would offer a limited form of citizenship to tens of thousands of Algerian Muslims that enabled them to take an active role in local politics. More broadly, the war provided a political education to the hundreds of thousands of Muslims from North Africa who spent considerable time in the metropole, tasting the fruits of greater equality and gaining exposure to mass political movements such as, lib such as liberal republicanism and socialism. Such a development continued with the more long-term arrival of tens of thousands of Muslim laborers in mainland France in the years following the war. This produced new political mobilizations of Muslim emancipationists, religious reformers, communists, and by the late 1920s, anti-colonial nationalists on both sides of the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, two broader developments of World War I worked as well to fuel the politics that would shape political attitudes and practices toward Jews and Muslims in France and across much of Europe in the 1930s and 1940s. First, the end of the Ottoman Empire brought millions of Muslims under European control in the British and French Middle East Mandate territories. In this context, the British made promises to both Jews and Arabs that turned Palestine into a fiercely contested territory with transnational implications. This gave a new urgency to competing European efforts to curry favor with significant parts of the Muslim world, leading to substantial propaganda campaigns, particularly by the 1930s. The Palestine Mandate also heightened the sense of inevitable Jewish-Muslim conflict as a consideration in domestic and imperial politics. Secondly, the untold violence of the war and its profoundly destabilizing effects on European society, politics, and economy helped to unleash what George Moss had famously called the, quote, brutalization of politics. Through this dynamic, political violence of language and physical attack became far more accepted. Ideas of exclusionary racial nationhood spread beyond a small faction of the extreme right. And fascist movements with paramilitary wings came to the fore, including in France by the 1930s. This brings me to our third and final snapshot from 1942, the sudden emergence of Muslim enthusiasts of fascism. On March 29, 1942, a meeting of the quasi-fascist, racist, ardently collaborationist political party, the Parti Populaire Française, or PPF, took place in Paris's large Magic City meeting hall. The meeting focused on the theme of, quote, French imperial unity, and was a product of a massive publicity effort that had included the production of 100,000 pamphlets and 2,700 posters in the weeks preceding the event. Three leading Muslim members of the PPF Sheikh Mohammed Zouani, Mostafa Ben Yema, and Siakbed Belgul traveled from Algeria to speak at the meeting. As they mounted the lectern, Belgul, Ben Yema, and Zouani found themselves standing before an audience of 800 spectators, including 350 to 400 Muslims, and behind them had been erected an enormous image of PPF party leader Jacques Delgado above Arabic words that translated as, quote, our policy governing with justice, respecting religions, and partnering in the general welfare. The phrase echoed the PPF's imperial motto of rule, respect, associate. Part of a policy platform that was deeply committed to the French empire and its hierarchies, but that offered Muslims and other colonized natives greater autonomy and respect for their cultural and religious traditions and institutions. All three Muslim leaders delivered impassioned speeches. And Yema, in particular, articulated a markedly exclusionary religious politics. He exclaimed, quote, God tells us in our Quran, the greatest enemy of Islam it is the Jew. He lamented that, quote, Jews at any price want to destroy Islam, and he linked Judaism with communism as a, quote, two-headed serpent that Muslims had to fight. This seemingly extraordinary scene was not the product of happenstance, but the culmination of a lengthy process that had begun in the 1930s as French and Algerian politics became increasingly bitterly divided between right and left. In the shadow of the tremendous losses of World War I, and in the context of economic recession, escalating international tensions, increasing political ineffectiveness on the part of the French parliamentary system, and a sense of cultural malaise, extremist political groups of the far right began to proliferate. The question of Jews and Muslims' place in the French polity became hotly debated in this period, 
And this was particularly in the context of two major issues. First, the question of the future of French Algeria, and secondly, the struggle between fascism and anti-fascism in France. The far-right groups that came to prominence in France, and even more so Algeria during these years, ranged widely. They, there were militant peasants, there were neo-monarchists, many groups in between, but they shared certain key characteristics. All of them were focused on veterans in the experience of World War I. All of them articulated an ardent, often xenophobic French nationalism. All supported traditional social hierarchies. All were fiercely anti-communist, and all had ambitions to replace republican democracy with an authoritarian system. <coughs> Most of the right-wing leagues had paramilitary dimensions and used symbols and gestures that drew on the imagery of German and Italian fascism. The far right and the perception of a fascist menace had an impact on Jewish-Muslim relations largely through the two largest quasi-fascist movements of the period, the Croix de Feu, or Cross of Fire, and from 1936 onward when it was founded, the Parti Populaire Française, or the PPF. The right-wing leagues really burst onto the national political stage with the anti-parliamentary demonstrations that they staged on February 6, 1934, <coughs> in which tens of thousands of demonstrators from far-right groups clashed with police in Paris, resulting in 17 deaths and 2,300 injuries. These riots crystallized left-wing fears of a growing fascist menace, and they provoked pride and political satisfaction on the right. And soon after, the leagues would seek to use their newfound prominence to expand their support. As both potential recruits and oppositional others, Jews and Muslims quickly became important signifiers for the breadth and limits of this effort. The Quadifu, or CDF, and other groups focused on recreating the national unity of the war's Union Sacre, or Sacred Union. The CDF explicitly declared on occasion that whether one was Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, it didn't matter. What one had done during World War I took precedence. Such an outlook appeared to confer nationalist credentials on Jews and Muslims. But eventually, each movement turned to the politics of anti-Semitism. Likewise, even as they recruited Algerian Muslims, the CDF and the other movements defended the inequalities of colonial society. The CDF was the largest of these movements and by far the most important. Its membership would reach 700,000 to a million, estimated uh, by the late 1930s. Uh, it had quite a tortured relationship with Jews. On the one hand, within the group, uh, a leading financial backer, uh, Amnesty Mercier, a leading activist, Ferdinand Robe, and more than a few members were Jewish. And from 1932 to 1936, with support from the Paris Jewish community, the CDF took part in religious ceremonies in Parisian synagogues to honor Jewish veterans in World War I. On repeated occasions until the late 1930s, the party leader, Lieutenant Colonel Francois de la Roque, publicly rejected anti-Semitism. But at the same time, local sections of the CDF, especially in Algeria, sought to stir up anti-Jewish sentiment. By 1935, some party activists in Algeria entered Jewish neighborhoods to chant, Long live La Hulk and Long live Hitler. The, the League recruited numerous Muslims in Algeria. And certain observers estimated that as much as 10% of the League's membership in Algeria was Muslim. CDF activists often employed anti-Semitism in their pitch to Muslims. Uh, for instance, certain militants urged Muslim crowds in Algeria to chant, down with the Jews, or, press, or pressured Muslim farm workers to stir up anti-Semitic sentiment among their fellow Muslims. The CDF and other right-wing groups were accused of helping to foment the greatest episode of Jewish-Muslim violence in the French <coughs> Empire during the war period, the riots of Constantine in Algeria in August 1934 that left 25 Jews and four Muslims dead. <coughs> It was in this context that on the 4th of April, 1936, the popular Jewish anti-racist organization, the Ligue Internationale Contre l'Antisémitisme, or the Ligue Khan, featured a satirical cartoon on the cover of its newspaper, Le Droit de Vivre, The Right to Live, which targeted the Croix de Feu. The cartoon featured the group's leader, the La Roque, as a genus, speaking to both Muslims and Jews. To the Muslims, he declares, the Frenchman is not your oppressor. Your enemy is the Jew, who robs you and ruins you. To the Jewish audience, meanwhile, he exclaims, quote, a wave of anti-Semitism would be disastrous for our country. And the words here were not invented. They were taken from actual CDF leaflets that had been distributed recently in Algeria. In the face of the rising menace of fascism in France, a counter-mobilization was occurring, as exemplified by uh, these kinds of critiques. And this took its greatest form in the left-wing coalition that became known as the Popular Front, which brought together the socialist and communist parties as well as the centrist radical party, 
I realize that the name is funny for a centrist party. I can explain more in the Q&A if people are interested. Uh, and many other groups that align their interests and their values, particularly in the cause of anti-fascism, also uh, supported the Popular Front uh, very visibly. The Popular Front won the May 1936 parliamentary elections, and its head, Leon Bloom, who was the leader of the Socialist Party and a proud Jew, became prime minister. Now, as if the rise of a left-wing government headed by a Jew of the Socialist Party were not enough, in his early months in office, Bloom teamed with reformist former Governor General Maurice Violet, who was hated by the Algerian colonists, to propose the bloom Violet Bill, which would have given full French citizenship to over 20,000 Algerian Muslims. As the recent work of historian Sam Coleman has shown, following the Popular Front's victory, as factory strikes erupted across not only France, but Algeria in June of 1936, often with ample Muslim participation, the right-wing ideologues of French Algeria thought they were living their worst nightmare. A wave of anti-Semitic violence, which had already been brewing in the preceding months, finally erupted across Algeria in full fury. It was particularly strong in the right-wing stronghold of Orhan, just to cite one of numerous incidents there that really became commonplace. On June 26, members of the CDF in Ohan trashed the inside of a local bar as they chanted anti-communist slogans. They then proceeded to the Jewish quarter, yelling down with the Jews, bloom to the gallows, and long live fascism. As I say, these incidents became quite commonplace in the weeks and months that followed. And what we see here is that fear of Jewish power Muslim revolt and leftist reform coalesced into a single movement of political violence. Anti-Semitism was in the lead, but Islamophobia was quite present as well. It was in the period following the election of the Popular Front that Jacques Delvio and his PPF party was formed and would begin its own recruitment of Muslims. As the Popular Front government collapsed, and along with it, the hopes for the Bloomville led reform, many Muslim activists who had placed their hopes in the anti-fascist coalition became deeply disillusioned with both the Popular Front and more broadly, uh, the notion of left-wing reform and Republican government. And some were suddenly, therefore, more receptive to groups like the PPF, which really redoubled their efforts in the aftermath of the collapse of the Popular Front, uh, redoubled their efforts, I should say, to recruit Muslims. Uh, and so the PPF, which had exhibited its own somewhat ambiguous relationship to anti-Semitism in the early years, became more decisively anti-Semitic, particularly following the death of a leading party member, David Abransky, who was Jewish, in February of 1937. Soon after that, its platform in Algeria declared, quote, North Africa must be totally free from Jewish control. And one French police report in 1938 described its message to Algerian workers in Marseille as, quote, France is in the hands of the Israelite. That is why North Africans do not find work and are in misery, because the Jew, being your enemy, only looks to do you harm. By the late 1930s, then, the far right in France and Algeria felt threatened enough by the prospect of a leftist Jewish-Muslim alliance that it concentrated its greatest hatred on the Jews, perceived as uniquely powerful and serving as a convenient, convenient and increasingly popular <coughs> scapegoat. Such conceptions reached their zenith, of course, with the Vichy regime during the Second World War. The period confirmed in the most tragic way possible that anti-Semitism was now more prevalent among the French state and society than Islamophobia. Jews, of course, officially became non-Aryans and faced a series of lethal anti-Semitic measures from Vichy and the Nazis. In Algeria, all Jews lost their French citizenship in autumn 1940. But what may surprise us more is that Muslims in France and North Africa, even though most still lacked French citizenship, racially became akin to Aryans. I've written more about this elsewhere, and I'd be happy to discuss it more in the Q&A. In short, it reflected strategic choices on the part of both Vichy and the Nazis as the French state and its occupiers competed fiercely over the future of French North Africa and the broader empire. Here, the resident general Alapetit's desire to enlist Muslims in the French cause and his certainty about Muslim-Jewish tension achieved a kind of logical fulfillment in imperial politics. In the course of the war, the Vichy regime and leading French collaborationist political parties like the PPF reached out to Muslims, giving Islam newfound presence in the French public sphere and recruiting Muslim support. It's only in all of these contexts that we can understand this 1942 meeting that served here as our final snapshot. 
Lest we be left, however, with the mistaken impression that most Muslims in the French Empire during World War II were anti-Semitic fascists, this was far from the case. We should note that for all of its publicity efforts, this meeting only attracted a few hundred Muslim participants among the tens of thousands who lived at that time in the French capital. Moreover, those who did support the Nazis' Vichy or collaboration often did so for reasons other than anti-Semitism. Anti-colonialism or the hope that the Germans or Vichy would be better masters than the Third Republic governments proved to be among the most common motivations. So what we've hopefully seen through these three snapshots and much of the period in between is a kind of process of evolution. In French colonial hierarchies of exclusion, where both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia figured prominently, it was first Islamophobia in the 19th century that seemed most important. Then, following World War I, a kind of competition emerged between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism within extremist right-wing politics, and then the Second World War saw the tragic resolution of this competition in the Holocaust in a surprisingly promising political environment for Muslims. Let me conclude by noting that at no time were anti-Semitism or Islamophobia separable from one another. Rather, they were often mutually reinforcing, either through policies of divide and rule or through the heightened fears they produced about both Jews and Muslims and their combined danger on the part of French authorities and right-wing political groups. And we see here that rather, being treated in rather than being treated in isolation, as they so often have been by scholars, in contexts where Jews and Muslims were present, both as people and as images, they must be studied in tandem. As has been clear repeatedly through a series of new twists and turns in Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in France and beyond since World War II, the two stories remain intertwined. For contemporary commentators as well then, who are often too quick to focus on one phenomenon to the exclusion of the other, such an entangled history bears remembering. Thank you. tell the story, it seems inevitable. Were there some interesting crossroads where things could have been different, either versus Jews or versus uh, Muslims? Or sorry, versus? Uh, Jews sorry. or versus Muslims? Could um, have been more right. strict? Or? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I, uh, it's interesting that you say that. I, I certainly don't mean to tell a story that I think is inevitable or yeah. that should read as inevitable. Right. Um, I think that the First World War uh, is one example of such a juncture where there were significant proposals for much greater reforms for Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, and these uh, reform efforts were stamped out uh, and had, for instance, as a number of people proposed, had all Algerian Muslims who fought in the war been made French citizens, uh, it would have altered the uh, political landscape in Algeria much more dramatically. Uh, now, having said that, the singling out of Jews and Muslims that took place in French policy from very early in Algeria yeah. did a lot to define the political landscape. Uh, and the, that meant that for many Jews and Muslims and non, you know, uh, just French observers, uh, Christian colonists, their only way to understand a whole series of encounters was as between Jews and Muslims. Yeah. When, of course, for many Jews and Muslims and Christians, uh, ethnic or religious identity was not necessarily foremost in their minds. So that did a lot to define the political landscape, but I think World War I is a crucial moment. I think one could even argue that uh, the failure of the Bloom Violette reforms in the 1930s made the brutality of the rest of the period of colonization and decolonization in Algeria much more likely. Uh, that is, I think it would be foolhardy to say that had those reforms gone through, somehow Algeria would have been happily been part of France. But I think it is possible to imagine a more uh, sort of organic process of decolonization in, in Algeria, more on the order of something like the British experience in India, not to say that that was smooth and simple. Um, good Thank question. You. Thank you kindly. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, 
in Algeria, it was found that there had been established large amount of, uh, for use of a better word, concentration camps that mm -hmm. were never populated or used. How does this fit into your, your narrative? Right, so that, that's a very good point, and it's actually relatively little known. Broadly speaking, in North Africa, there were over 100 labor camps established during the Second World War, and a very significant number of them were actually used. Now, they were not used exclusively for Jews. Uh, they were used for a variety of groups of political dissidents, uh, other minorities. Um, Jews figured disproportionately among them, as they did in concentration camps in Europe that were not, quote, specifically for Jews. Uh, Tunisia is actually the case where we have good reason to believe that the Germans were very interested in <coughs> actually using extermination methods had they been there long enough, because it's the only area where the Germans occupied a portion of North Africa for about eight months of the war from late 1942 to uh, mid-1943. Um, but you know, the, the fact is the, the policies of the Vichy regime uh, and with the support of, of the Nazis, uh, and I say that carefully in the sense that many Vichy policies preceded the Nazis, uh, asking them to do it, right? The, the elimination of citizenship for Algerian Jews in autumn of 1940 was entirely a Vichy initiative. The Nazis did not force them to do that. Uh, but but that, those set of policies uh, were viewed as a great betrayal by many Algerian Jews. Uh, they were remembered uh, as a betrayal by many Algerian Jews. Uh, it also took a very long time for Algerian Jews' citizenship to be restored after the Allies landed in November 1942 and liberated Algeria. It took almost a year uh, because the governor general who sort of took over immediately after the Allied landing uh, in Algeria, even though he was relatively loyal to the resistance, Albi uh, Giro, he was anti-Semitic, uh, he was supportive of the uh, settler classes and their opposition to Jewish citizenship. And so he once more revoked the Crimea Decree even when he reversed all other Vichy legislation in Algeria. So uh, there's certainly, there's this big picture of settler uh, anti-Semitism into which I think those camps fit. Um, and one of the remarkable stories of the war, which I didn't get to, is the fact that by and large, Muslims in Algeria were extremely uh, sympathetic to their Jewish neighbors during the war. And that was something that was spoken about uh, by many, many Algerian Jews for decades after the war. Uh, there's, uh, there are calls from Algerian Muslim leaders during the war to their followers to not take Jewish property, to not support uh, the anti-Semitic measures of the Vichy regime. And so uh, this is a moment where the provocations that are very much there from Vichy don't actually, generally speaking, work, uh, which is interesting. It appears to be the case that the relegation of Muslims to a lower stat, or excuse me, of Jews to a lower status than Muslims was not something that really excited most Muslims. Muslims mostly wanted greater rights for themselves. Uh, and actually, many of them said, wait a minute, if the granting of citizenship is as fickle as that it can be undone in a second, the French citizenship is even less enticing than we thought it was uh, because it's capable of being reversed at a moment's notice. So, questions? Um, I was wondering if you'd explain more, you mentioned that French officials were hostile towards Jews um, in your first snapshot, and I was wondering if you'd explain more the power struggle and why they were targeting Jews specifically? It's a good question. Um, so, you know, the, basically there's a perception that's not entirely unfounded, particularly in certain regions, that Jews have a lot of economic power when the uh, French land in Algeria. And the truth is there's a very small number of Jews, but there are certain Jews who are extremely wealthy, and they're very hard to control uh, in terms of legally speaking. Uh, they often have protection also from the British. Uh, they sort of operate between borders of Algeria and Morocco. And meanwhile, they have all of this power in the local economy uh, in a way that sort of as you're trying to set up a colonial administration, a colonial economy is very hard to work with. So it became very frustrating to certain colonial officials very quickly. And they sort of leapt from there to kind of age-old stereotypes about Jewish power and Jewish greediness and these kinds of things. Um, 
So, and, and you know, there had also been Jews who joined in the resistance, uh, which was much more widespread among Muslims, but there were Jews who participated in that as well. Uh, so I think a lot of the officials who arrived there were already probably shaped by uh, anti-Jewish stereotypes of Catholicism, which were very widespread in France at this time. Uh, and they saw certain things reinforced for them on the ground in ways that they found very frustrating. What? Um, so we were talking about this as we walked in, but I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more. So in our class, we've been talking a lot about um, the, the, the legacies of Christianity in shaping um, relations towards Jews in Europe and Muslims outside of Europe and maybe later Muslims in Europe. Um, the story you tell, and I'm very sympathetic to the story obviously, is one very much grounded in local political contingency. It's actually, to my mind, not so inevitable, but as, in other words, a uh, response to particular troubling developments on the ground, um, whether abroad, or whether in Algeria or in France. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, especially given how you ended, about how these stories are forever and constantly entwined, how much emphasis you would want to put on that point you made early on about Christian mm. sort of thinking about colonialism as a, mm. as a missionizing experience with the emphasis on Christianity, and how much you wanted this, of this story you want to emphasize on um, the particular sort of struggle, <coughs> the struggles for power in each of the scenarios. Mm, mm. Well, that's a great question. The, I mean, to some degree, the local struggles are, I mean, you know, in my larger, uh, in my, in my book, I talk a lot about triangularity between France and Jews and Muslims. Uh, I didn't use that language here, but uh, the local struggles are still very much a product of, you know, if we want to think about Islamophobia and anti-Semitism as intertwined in France, it's partly because they're kind of in this triangular relationship with the French state and French society. So uh, that is to say that uh, even though these are local struggles produced by contingency, they're also produced in this kind of larger, sorry, ongoing <laughs> relationship. Um, the question about Catholicism and Christianity, I mean, I think it's, it's a little too convenient sometimes to see everything that comes in a secular guise as simply a secularized version of Christianity. Um, so I, I think we want to avoid that. I do think that Catholicism in 20th century France, broadly speaking, is quite a bit more important than many historians treat it as. Um, and if we just want to look at sort of one you know, uh, little uh, case study, Ariaskovich has recently published a very fine book called The Modernity of Others, in which he shows that in both France and Germany, Jews really used anti-Catholicism to their advantage in the 19th century to position themselves as modern. They used stereotypes about Catholics that were emergent among those who were secular liberals to say, we're different from Catholics, we're against Catholics, and that's how we show that we're modern. During the First World War, Jews do everything possible to show how similar they are to Christians in many respects. Uh, and if you look at the way Jews constantly tout their participation in the so-called Union Sacre, or the Sacred Union, the way Jews are particularly proud, for instance, of the famous story from autumn 1914, where the chief rabbi, Abraham Bois, is killed while he's offering the last rites to a Christian soldier and putting a crucifix on his neck. There are thrilled by the story. They print this story over and over again. And what better story to show Jewish proximity to Catholic France, if you will. And meanwhile, stories about Jewish Muslim Brotherhood in the trenches are much less often talked about in many discussions of, most discussions, I should say, of Jews fighting, uh, Algerian Jews fighting in regiments that include Muslims, never mention their Muslim comrades. So I think that in those ways, you know, uh, Catholics are part of this triangle and a kind of desire to be proximate uh, to Catholicism uh, often uh, could shape uh, the way Jews and Muslims interacted with each other. Um, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but. Paris. Thank you for a very inspiring talk. I would like to. Um, it's a little depressing, but okay. <laughs> 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 okay. 
been having quite a few depressing talks this past week here at Brown. Um, I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit more on the um, semantics, on the nature of anti-Semitic discourse in France. Uh, more precisely, there is a l big literature on, on anti-Semitic discourse in France. I was wondering, bringing in the colonial dimension, the fact that is that we here have to do with not Ashkenazi or European assimilated Jews, but with Maccabi Jews mm -hmm. uh, coming from a very different cultural tradition right. or supposedly representing a very different one. How would that complicate the story of, of anti-Semitism? How would an imperial perspective uh, complicate the story of anti-Semitism in the metropolis or vice versa? That is, and therefore, blur the categories even more mm -hmm. uh, between uh, how is a Maghrebi Jew represented and, uh, and how is, is perhaps not. Right, that, that's a great question. Um, just offer a few quick thoughts. I mean, to some degree, I would refer you to uh, a book that just came out that I, that I mentioned, which is Samuel Collins' book about uh, colonial fascism in the 1930s. Uh, and I think he's given sort of the most thorough and, and really, uh, you know, the first serious exploration of this question about what he, I mean, he calls it colonial fascism, one can debate the term, uh, what he refers to as colonial antisemitism. Uh, and what he argues, and I think he does so rather persuasively, is that uh, the conservative settler classes in Algeria, particularly in the region he focuses on, Ohan, which was a more conservative region, and which also had a, a very significant Jewish population and a high percentage uh, of the local population, about 21% as of uh, 1931. Um, in that region, he argues, basically, Jews became the source of all fears. Jews became the scapegoat for everything. Uh, whether there's a clear distinction between Ashkenazic uh, and uh, Mizrahi Jews is not so clear, right? Land Bloom's presence in the popular front is clearly part of what galvanizes the anti-Semitism of that moment uh, among the settler classes. But on the other hand, it does seem to be the case that the fact that this group of natives became citizens and they were not entitled to become citizens, and this was completely imposed by the metropolitan government that doesn't understand anything good that goes on in here in Algeria, and they don't understand the kind of conservative European space we're trying to make here in Algeria, according to the, their ideology, that does seem to be important. So I think certain traditional anti-Semitic stereotypes, which were uh, commonly circulating between metropolitan colony among conservative groups in some ways connected with stereotypes about Arabs, uh, notions about illegitimacy uh, related to those stereotypes. Um, Maghrebi Jews in the metropole are, there are, there are actually more uh, Mizrahi Jews in the metropole than people realize in this period. By the even Second World War there are 30, 35,000. Uh, but they're pretty invisible to the larger French population. Uh, their knowledge about Jews is pretty much restricted to Ashkenazic Jews, and anti-Semitic stereotypes are really built around groups like the Rothschilds and their connections to capital, uh, these kinds of things. It's really only in the wake of decolonization when you have these very large numbers of Jews come from the Maghreb, then you actually have numerous instances where Jews from the Maghreb get called Arabs um, sometimes people maybe know they're Jewish, oftentimes they don't. Um, and so, so they have this uh, case of being associated uh, with uh, the, the, the colonized. I, I think that broadly speaking, you could say that the way in which the difference is significant is that Ashkenazic Jews are, even as early as the 19th century, potentially at least white. Uh, and the Jews in Algeria are, for many people, uh, even as they become French citizens, particularly for many anti-Semites, they're lumped in with other, quote, Arabs or Andijen as not white. Uh, and, and therefore, there's, there's quite a, a difference in the racial conception of the two groups. Any other questions? Um, I, I have a question about the Okay, um, I actually have one other before we end this officially, but 
because you alluded to it, and I think there's interest in the room. I'm surprised nobody's asked about it. Oh, yeah. If you could just say a little bit more about the impact of the Middle East on the story that you're telling. Um, I'm doing this for my students, so I feel uh, <laughs> I've not asked this question, but I think there's interest in my class on that question. So. Right. Um, well, yes, of course, it's some, to some degree, it might be called an elephant in the room. Um, so the, you know, I, I think, right, so I alluded to the fact that the First World War is important for many reasons, including the sort of real emergence of Palestine as a contested space. Uh, and what we see in the 1930s is this very fierce effort uh, of a series of colonial powers to compete for allegiance, partly in North Africa and partly in what is suddenly a more kind of seen as a more kind of open playing field, if you will, of the former Ottoman states uh, of the Arab heartlands, uh, Syria, Egypt, Iraq, Palestine. Uh, and in that context, you see tremendous anti-Semitism directed toward uh, Arabs who are perceived as going, you know, uh, naturally receptive to it uh, because they were already hostile toward Jews. Now, now they feel Jews have usurped their land in Palestine. We know all the Arabs. Uh, love Palestine and hate the Zionists for being there. Right? I mean, that's sort of the assumption. Uh, and the, the impact of that propaganda is hard to calculate. Uh, it doesn't seem to have been enormous, uh, given the relatively small numbers of Muslims who actively participate in collaboration from the, those territories during the Second World War. Uh, but it is real, uh, and it does help to provoke <laughs> conversations and debates among a lot of Muslims in those regions during the 1930s about fascism, about what they think of fascism. Uh, and it certainly provokes, provokes thoughts about alliances of convenience with fascism. The Algerian nationalists go to Berlin, not all of them. Uh, and their leader, Abbas Ali Hajj, completely condemns it. But a number of the leading Algerian nationalists in France go to Berlin in 1939 to try to meet with the Nazis and say, we want to work together. Give us arms. We'll help you. Uh, and they do that because they're convinced of a possible alliance of convenience. So I think what happens is a whole new sort of playing field of politics for largely, in many ways, Muslims opens in the Middle East. Uh, and that provokes a very strong anti-Semitic propaganda that's directed toward Muslims. Uh, and it may also help us to understand uh, some of the greater sort of ambiguity about Muslims in other places in terms of the sort of larger effort to attract them. Logically, one had to avoid being too shrill in terms of Islamophobia uh, in, say, the metropole uh, in the 30s if one hoped to attract uh, support of Muslims elsewhere. So that's a great question. Any other questions? Okay, well then we will thank uh, Professor